and uh, uh, good uh, talk. So thank you thank very you. much. Uh, thank the organizers for putting me on the end of the day. <laughs> thank you for staying here. Um, and we've been talking the whole day about movement and everybody is sitting, so I'm happy I can walk around here a little bit. Um, I haven't seen any work on children today, which is good, because that's my topic. And uh, I've been studying uh, the development of children from baby on till, say, about 16 years of age. That's the uh, range I've been studying, uh, movement skill development. And I'm going to tell a little bit about it, but I'm de I've been asked to really talk about my field work and not about the things I do in the lab. Because uh, uh, in the um, University of Leuven, we are very much into uh, fine motor control, we're doing uh, functional fMRI, we're doing, of course, all the kinematics and the kinetics that you're doing. But my work in Africa, we don't have anything. We have a few plastic bags that we put together to make a ball. Uh, we find some old stones that we use for a balance. So it's a totally different world, but I think uh, maybe it's of interest too. Um, for people who are keep asking me, what's the difference between Holland and the Netherlands? Because everywhere I go in Brazil, people want to know. Holland is that little bit over there, that's the Netherlands, and only this part is Holland, okay? So the people that come from Amsterdam come from Holland, but I'm coming from the east, so I'm coming from the Netherlands. Um, the work I'm going to present is from Cape Town, where we work in the townships. Um, it's a beautiful area, but the children there are less privileged than uh, most of the children in other areas. Okay, what's my talk going to be about? Three points. The first thing is, how can we take motor development and experience, because the two go together, into account when we test children for physical fitness? The other thing is, what is the influence of motor proficiency on the uh, physical fitness test outcomes that we use? So if we test strength or power or anaerobic or aerobic fitness, what is the impact of poor motor control and of poor motor experience? Um, and the last thing I want to say a few words about is how can we adapt training to this poor uh, motor control so that we can still train what we want. If we want to get their endurance better, uh, then how can we do that with poor motor control? And if we want their motor control better, how can we do that without being hampered by poor uh, physical fitness? Okay, I hope the first few slides are familiar to all of you, but you never know, so I put them in anyway. Uh, many physical fitness tests contain running. And running is something that is sort of innate, but it's not ready when you're born. If you have a, a, a child that's just born and you put it on the table, it can walk, yeah? Um, but of course, it doesn't have the balance yet, and there's still a lot to be developed. So you have to be careful if you use running in children that you know that they have developed the skill, because otherwise you're testing motor coordination and you're not testing physical fitness. Um, so it's very different if, for instance, you have children with uh, obesity. It's very different if you have children that had never had the opportunity to run. Um, and the stages of running have, have been described a long time ago. The first person who did that was Wickstrom. And, um, that was done based on videos, yeah, just films that were made and every frame was looked at and so they made the first analysis and since then we have tried to do it better but we haven't had much to add because these first analyses were pretty good. So in the beginning you see a minimal flight, you see children let on, land on a flat foot and you see the arms used for balance, so they're up high, yeah. Later, we see that the arms start to make an opposite movement, but it's still in this plane, not in this plane. Yeah? And the legs will cross over and go to the different sides, and the projection of the heel is not yet 
on the butt. That's what happens later. And then we make a nice arm movement. So if you look at this child, look at his arm movement. At this age, you would expect to have a arm movement in the sagittal plane, and he's still going very much forward. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know this is dangerous in Brazil, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Um, based on uh, Professor Inneke's talk this morning about um, changes in reflexes based or, or basic motor control mechanisms based on experience and training, I think this is interesting to look at people who have trained very specific and many hours. I would say about 10,000 hours of soccer training, don't you think? That's about the amount that's in here. So if you here look at the task specificity that has been developed by making so many hours, uh, I'll show you a, a short part of the video. This one's available on the net, the whole thing. I've been cutting in it and I've put some Dutch comments in it, so don't look at them. Or do you want to learn Dutch? Where's the sound? So it's the comparison between a sprinter and between a soccer player. Not the best in the world, but still. It's a very different pattern. So there's a difference in time between the sprinter and the soccer player. And now they're still running, but they have to do the zigzag. The sprinter never does it. Ronaldo does it all the time. Six point eight. I use more this event than run in straight line, so this is my line up of side my start. You see them simultaneously, which is interesting. This is good. continue with the thing in. Can you hear me anyway? Okay. Um, so what you see is that based on a lot of training, you get good in certain aspects of a task. And that doesn't mean if you're a good straight runner uh, that you can also do a good zigzag. I used this after I saw this 
I've made a comparable experiment with my poor control, motor control children, because my hypothesis was if they can walk, s run straight, that's easier than when they who have to do the slalom. So I expected to have a huge difference between the straight run and between the slalom. So I'll show you that later. Um, the same is the case for the long jump. So here we see when it things develop, the long jump is often used as a measure of power. Yeah? because you have to have uh, one explosive movement and the distance that you can jump is seen as a, me as a measure of, uh, of power. Um, of course, here you have different aspects of the jump. First of all, we know uh, people in, in sports, you have a run. Yeah, but we'll in, in testing, usually we start in a, a stable position. So we put the child or the sports person in the start position. We have to take off the flight through the air and the landing. These are very important aspects. And um, if you look how this starts, yeah, in a very young child, okay, there is a takeoff. There is a short flight and there is a landing. But you see the child still needs the arms for balance. Yeah? It sort of is shortly in the air and, and jumps on flat feet or lands on flat feet. And there is not what we see later is that the uh, top of the feet leave uh, the floor when you totally extend it already because it's the last push off that makes you fly. If you look at this in slow motion, you see there is an extension already, yeah. but it still takes a long while before you see the total stretch. Yeah. Okay. So here I've got three compared children, a very young one in the left upper corner an older child in the left lower corner, uh, one of the therapists that I asked to jump, and one of my children that uh, is treated for developmental coordination disorder, which of course falls after the fall. If you look at the way he bends, I'll have them in separate later. Yeah. You see how much difference there is. And this young girl, not even six years old, already has a very nice pattern, there's a full extension at liftoff, yeah, have one more look, arm, position, there you go, flight, and stable landing, compare that to this boy, the way he goes down, nose on his knees, arms using for balance, and an unsafe landing. Okay, so if we look at the jump, we see that there's a long development from about four to seven years of age. There's a lot of refinement in, s in adulthood afterwards, and then after that there's the sport-specific uh, refinement, the task-specific training. Yeah? The most important thing then is the rate of force development, but before that it's the starting position and it's the balance for the young children, which is a very different aspect. So you first have to have the, the movement pattern before you can measure force. Before that, you measure coordination and you measure development. Yeah? The other thing is children change immensely when they're growing. There are periods when they uh, uh, grow seven centimeters in a year. Yeah? So you can imagine that all the things that you have built in as your normal motor program or your normal what you expect your weight to be or your height to be has changed in a very short time, so you have to update all your information about your own body. Okay, this is the last time. Okay. Uh, task specificity in jumping. He was forced to stand still and put his hands on his hips. So now, this is the thing, you don't 
job like that in the game. Okay. Yeah. We have to make Let's it. try that. Let's try that. Three, two, one, go. Now the results are very different. Ronaldo's body strength enables him to jump 78 centimeters. It's almost a double. He just imagines there is a ball. He comes and um, heads the ball into a goal. Look at that. Yeah. Okay, so even if you have the strength, the way you have learned to use it is going to determine how high you jump. It's almost double the jump that he makes because this is the way he has been trained and this is the way he has been using it. Okay, so if a fundamental movement skill is used in a test or training, developmental stages and experience have to be taken into account. If motor development lags, which it does, now and then, look at the difference between the normal developmental stage and what you see. If what you see is just the same, but a younger stage, then probably nothing is wrong. If you see something that doesn't occur in normal development, then probably there is something wrong. It's not so bad if a child jumps, say, two years younger, but if it's a normal movement pattern. But if you see all different ways of finding a solution that doesn't uh, come out in a normal pattern, you can see that probably something is wrong. I'll show you two children. The task is go up and down the stairs as fast as you can in 30 seconds. As fast as you can. Okay, what's the major constraint here? Hmm? Balance is something. Getting the task. What is as fast as possible? Yeah. The idea of going over, going back. Yeah. It's, it's balance. He poor, has poor balance. He has poor coordination. And it looks like he doesn't have the concept of as fast as possible because the therapist keeps telling, go and you're doing well, and somehow he's not speeding up. Then look at the girl. It's a different problem. What's here the constraint? Strength. Strength. This child has very poor strength in the quads. And uh, of course, for children, uh, the stairs are high. Yeah? Because if you look at their uh, length of their uh, shaft and you see how far they can go, for them, it's a very high step. But if you would test this child more precisely, you would see that here the major constraint is not so much balance, but is more strength. And that is one of the problems that we have when we do an assessment. You have to find out within the task, that's important, so we don't put the child on the table. Yeah, we do every now and then, because you have to do some localized tests. But the advantage is to test and train within the task, because that's what the child needs. And it could be that you can't do a leg press with kids like this, you know, but you can do uh, walking up and down stairs with a backpack. You can them give them uh, something to carry up and down uh, stairs to make it heavy. You can adapt the size of the stairs. You can uh, help them up first uh, using a rail going up and going down to get sort of a plyometric uh, exercise. So there's a lot of things that you can do 
uh, they have to carry uh, the the bear is on one stair and the, the 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 doll is on the other one. You have to make it fun, otherwise children won't do it at this age. Um, second point is what is the influence of motor proficiency on physical fitness outcomes um, when we really test it. So we took an example in the children with the developmental coordination disorder and um, I'm not going to go too much into the definition but these are children that are substantially below what you would expect in their motor control. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, It bothers them and their parents and their teachers. Yeah, It's very early in development. It is not something that occurs when they're eight or nine years old. You see it already early, say two years, three years of age, you can definitely see it. And it can't be explained by something else. These children don't have a mental retardation, they don't have a, neuro a real neurological disease. There is, it's, it's most of the time unexplained. Of course, we know a lot of factors that influence it. Yeah, I'm going to focus today on this part of the definition. So their motor control is below what you would expect for age, given the opportunity for skill learning and use. So they must have been exposed, because otherwise it's just deprived. It's not a, a disorder. Yeah? Constraints can be in the child. Constraints can be in the task. Sometimes parents want children to do two difficult things and they think the child is not doing well, but they're just asking two difficult things. And it could be in the environment. If you're playing like the, we heard on, on artificial grass or you play on grass, it's a different mo movement pattern. So uh, the environment also has a constraint. If you never are able to play a certain game, then you won't develop it. Okay. Um, we see in the neighborhoods where I work um, that there are a lot of children that are very clumsy. Part of these children um, have fetal alcohol syndrome because their mother drank too much alcohol when she was pregnant. Um, a lot of the uh, mothers use drugs when they were pregnant. And um, the other thing is these children have very little opportunities to do anything. So they're either in their little houses or they're at the schools and there's no sports, there's no terrain where it's safe to play and there's no physical education. The physical education has been replaced by hygiene education, which is very important because 50% of these kids have HIV. Yeah. Um, the impact of poor coordination is even larger in poor uh, circumstances because the children don't have the opportunity to learn and most of these children will end up in vocations where they do manual labor or they climb to uh, build in construction. These are not children that get high-tech jobs. They probably end up in professions where they sweep the street or uh, clean the, the garbage or that kind of thing. So it's very a ma lot of manual work. Okay, the study we did. We found 70 children that were below the fifth percentile on a, mo on a motor test and we found uh, 70 children that were in the normal range on the motor test. We tested these children, a lot of muscles in arms and legs, uh, using a handheld anometer. Uh, we did the functional strength measure, a measure that we developed ourselves and has been published two years ago. Uh, we did a shuttle run test, which I think all of you will know. And we did the muscle power sprint test. I don't know if you know that one. But I'll short explain. These are, have all good test, retest reliability. All the students that um, did the testing uh, were trained. They were all master pediatric physical therapists, which is a four-year program in Holland. And they all came on a voluntary basis, paid their own uh, plane ticket to go with me to South Africa and stayed there for eight weeks to do this uh, research. Okay, uh, the Movement ABC I don't know if that you're familiar with the test, is the most used test for children with developmental coordination disorder and it comprises of 
uh, manual dexterity items like posting coins, pegboard, threading a lace, uh, and some pen and paper tasks. It comprises of aiming and catching, so it's not throwing, it's accuracy. So aiming and catching, and different balance tasks like hopping in squares or jumping in squares. So here again, accuracy is the most important thing because you can't go far, you have to go in these squares and those are only 30 centimeters, so it's not a distance. The uh, functional strength measure that we developed um, has very good uh, test-retest uh, reliability and uh, consists of eight items. Uh, four items measuring predominantly power and four items which are more um, um, muscular endurance. So the rep most repetitions that you can make in 30 seconds. Um, the first item is the underhand throw, or the overhand throw, uh, where the children have a sandbag standing on their eight. To throw the bag as far as possible. So here is no accuracy, doesn't matter where it lands, as far as possible without a swing. So they have the bag behind their head and they can throw it away as far as they can. Yeah? The same thing with the underhand bag, the behind their legs and throw it as far, far as they can. Then there's the long jump. Doesn't matter if they fall after landing because we don't want to have any uh, emphasis on, on uh, coordination and then there's the chest pass. All the other ones are as many repetitions as the children can make in 30 seconds. So there's the lateral step up where they do this. Yeah. There is running up and down the stairs which you've seen. There's lifting a box depending on the age with three kilos or four kilos. It, it doesn't sound that much, but it's very hard for the kids. And then there's the sit to stand, which is a squat. Yeah, they just touch the uh, bench, which is at 40, a level of, 40, uh, of uh, 90 degrees with their butt, and then they come back up. What we wanted is that it measured something close to strength, but not the same thing as the handheld anemometer because we call it functional strength. And this, for instance, is the correlation with the handheld uh, strength in the knee, in the quadriceps, and you see that the correlations are there, but not extremely high. And that's what we wanted, yeah? Because if it was the same, then we didn't have to develop. The other thing is we didn't want it to have a high correlation with a coordination test. And that's what you see, all the correlations are much lower. But of course, standing on one leg for balance and doing a step up does have a little bit of a correlation. Yeah? Okay. The other test we did was the shuttle run. Anybody want to see it? You all know it? No? When setting up the deep test course, pylons are placed 20 meters apart, either in a gym or on a field or playground surface. To begin the deep test, students wait for the audio track to begin. Once they hear the first beat, they run from one end of the course to the next and rest. Stop level one, one. As the beep test progresses, the time interval between beeps shortens, thereby giving the students less rest okay. between each interval run. Prior to the beat, the audio track indicates each level of the test. For this test, I brought from Holland 50 pairs of shoes, which were stolen the next day. I'm not so sure if the kids like it in school, if they do it uh, two times a year, at least in Holland, they don't like it. But these kids really liked it. And um, once they'd done it, they got some extra food, because most of these children are on a food program. And the children that didn't participate, they went to the uh, water, they wet their uh, face, and then they came to me and said, Bowen, I've been running, can I get a uh, coin for the uh, food program? So they just 
didn't run, but they were all sweaty and wet and hoped that they would get a food coin. Okay, what did we find? The children with poor motor coordination and the children with normal uh, motor coordination did not differ in strength when we used the brake method. So we just put the uh, HHD against it and the child had to keep uh, the leg or the arm stable. Yeah? Uh, from a coordination perspective, I think that is the easiest movement there is because you feel the resistance and you just resist what, what the push that you get. There was a difference on the pinch grip that you see there, but in that case you have to, be your, you have to generate your own force. There's, you feel a resistance, but you still, you're still you're generating and you have to do it because there's no re real resistance. Yeah? So the knee extensors of the uh, children with developmental coordination uh, were stronger. But even in these children that were on a food program, the DCG children were already heavier than the normal controls children, yeah? which is what you see in all the literature in developed countries. There we call it obese. These were the children, the DCG children had normal weight and the normal children were underweight, uh, probably because they are already using less energy. You could say in a country like that it's a wise thing to do, but it's probably not their choice. In the meantime, and I'll give you a very short overview of the results. And because there were a lot of tests in it, I will report them as um, effect sizes, which is always nice, because then you compare over the different uh, outcome measures uh, what you see. Okay? So, of course, the children were different on the movement ABC, because that's what we selected them on. Yeah? But then, a simple thing like the sit to stand in children that didn't have a difference in the quad strength, yeah, you see already a huge difference. And the only thing they had to do was this, you know? From a coordination perspective, it doesn't look that different. Dif the total uh, functional measure was very different. The lateral step up was very different. Climbing stairs was different. Grip force was less different. The standing long jump was a bit different. Their weight was higher. Their waist circumference was uh, larger. Their knee extension was more in both sides and their body index was also more. Remember these were children that get extra food in school. Okay. So what did we see? The isometric strength was the same or better. The explosive power was less, muscular endurance was less, shuttle run aerobic test was less, the muscle power sprint test was the same. Uh, they are equally strong, I thought, but maybe they can't use their strengths in a coordinated way. Is the coordination perhaps the limiting factor here? And are we not measuring physical fitness with standardized physical fitness tests? So we did a second study to look at the validity of all these tests. Because the literature says children with DCD s skip doing physical activity because they're not good at it. And that's why they get overweight. Yeah. It could also be that partly we measure their poor coordination and that it's not as bad as it is. So we did a new study where we tried to take motor uh, development and motor proficiency into account and we looked at all the tests that we had and I remembered the video that I saw of Ronaldo and I thought maybe that is a way to determine what is the effect of, I'll show you one child with coordination disorder, so you never forget that coordination is a point here. This is one of the severe ones. You can imagine if you move like this, you're not getting as many repetitions as children who have normal coordination. It's not spastic, it's not hypertone, it's just really a matter of uh, poor coordination. Okay, so in this new study, 
we compared uh, 36 normal children and 36 children with poor motor development. And we did our um, running tests. The first running test is a running test in which children had to run 50 feet, which is approximately 15 meters, go to the other side, bend down, pick up a little cone, and come back. So they ran 30 meters. But they had a full stop. They had to prepare their arm to be there, pick it up, come back up, and, get, and run back. Yeah? The last run is full speed, because the assessor is there, and if you cross the line, you press the button. The next test we did is the, uh, they had to do five meters, but ten times. So you start, you go over the line. When you're over the line, you can go back, and you go over the line, and you can go back and over the line. I love this. I've been sitting there all day. So they run 50 meters. Yeah? 30 meters, 50 meters. But you have all these stops and turns and stops and turns, and only the last time you dash over the line like we did in the first test. And then we get my Ronaldo test. Yeah, I told that to the kids and they love it. Yeah. Okay, so you get. Oh, why is this not working? I'm going backwards. That's not working. Okay, they start. They make a turn to the left. They make a turn to the right. They cross the line. Once the foot is over the line, they turn. They make a turn to the other side. Turn to the other side. There. And so they do this ten times. Yeah, so they have this turn over the line, that side, that side, turn over the line. So there's a lot of turns. My hypothesis was that this would have a huge impact if the poor coordination was one of the causes that they did poor on the agility tests. So this is what the uh, TD, typically developing normal children, did. The dash with the stop, 30 meters, took as much time as the 50 meters going from one side to the other. So that stop takes a lot of time. Yeah? And for the slalom, you see a little bit of an increase. Not that much. This is what the children with developmental coordination did. They almost doubled their time from 60 seconds to 110 seconds yeah? by doing the slalom. And this is the comparison, the two groups. Yeah? So it does have an impact. And this shows us that if you would do a test or if you want to do a training, if I want to train agility, I can use the slalom. If I want to change, uh, change endurance, yeah, uh, this could be hampering them because they're not going to uh, go through the whole running because it's going to be too hard for them to do. Okay. So what is important for uh, physical educators and for physical therapists who work with children, that you always think in the task. Look, what is the task doing? What is the difference between just running, picking up something and running back? What makes the task hard? What is the extra constraint that is in it? Yeah? And what is the test supposed to measure? What could happen if I have a problem in uh, stiffness in the knees, for instance? Yeah? If you have children with arthrocryposis or something and they have a, a limited range of motion, if you would do a test like that, they could run, but they can't bend, then that is the constraint that will impact the validity of the test, because you're no longer measuring agility, no, you're measuring range of motion, because the child can't go back, can't go down. So that is very important that if you work with children that have some kind of impairment, that you take the impairment into account and that you see what is different in the test that you're doing. So um, what we did, we did the functional strength measure, lower extremity items, we did the running items that I just showed you, and we added some agility items from the brunings ozeretsky test, which are the following. Stepping sideways over a beam, it's a very hard task because you want to jump and you have to do it like this. Yeah. Uh, one leg stationary hop, one leg side hop, yeah, and the two leg side hop. 
But these are all things that should be done within 15 seconds. Okay. So these were the items. And then you see blue, yellow, and green, and that is what they're supposed to measure. So you would expect the blue items to measure functional strength. You would expect the, the yellow items to me measure something like anaerobic running, and you would uh, expect the green items to measure something like anaerobic and agility, because there's a lot of side movements in it. And what do we see if we measure typically developing children? All these test developers will be very happy because this is exactly what you see. If you look at the factor analysis, you see that the, the largest loading of the functional strength items is in the functional strength. Of the aerobic running is in these items. Of the uh, aerobic agility, exactly where you wanted it. But these are typically developing children. What happens if we do the same thing with developmental coordination disorder. Does it look the same? Looks very different. Which is again a warning that the validity of a test is dependent on the group you're using it in. Strange things happen. The aerobic run and jump component seems to be the largest explaining factor and not the strength like in the typically developing children. And you see that it's far more distributed. Yeah? Also, the side hop and the side jump load on aero anaerobic uh, uh, run and jump. I added to jump, because in the typically developing children, it was just run. But here, the jump goes there. The item lateral step, which is supposed to be a strength item, now loads together with the step and the hop, which are all reversal movements. And it looks like uh, uh, getting a fast contraction, agonist, antagonist, agonist, antagonist, that that is one of the major problems in these children. They can't do it. Yeah? And the only the two very simple items, sitting down and lifting a box, which have no balance component in it whatsoever, because you're on two legs, mm -hmm. still load on functional strength. Normal child. Uh, the table is adapted to their height, so it's all uh, the same height for the uh, d for the different children. We measure their wrist, and the table has to be at the uh, wrist height. It's a heavy task to do this for 30 seconds. Okay. Now a child with a uh, uh, neuromuscular disease. Okay. It looks like we put 20 kilos in it, but it's only three. <laughs> okay. Good. What is the influence of poor motor provision on test outcomes? The literature says poor uh, scores are the result of sedentary behavior. That is the overall tendency in the literature, because children don't take part. But it may also be that coordination uh, is measured and that that is one of the limiting factors. So if you are not proficient enough, and that's where the physical education comes in, you may not take part in play and sports and get no experience because you're sitting at the sideline. So please, if a child is not so good, let it play in the game. Let it play in the training. And I hate it when young kids are selected, you know, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, they're selected because they're good and the other ones yeah, that are not so proficient cannot play. Please let them take part. 
yeah? Because if you have less physical activity, you will burn less calories, and then the children will come when they're 10 or 11 or 12 years old, and they have to go in your obesity program. So please let them learn what to do, let them have fun from the beginning, and don't wait until we catch up, uh, because they have to have to sit on the side and um, by then it's very hard to get them active because if you have a body like that uh, it's no longer fun to take part. The other thing is that the interpretation of norms and tests have to be taken into account if a child has poor coordination or if a child has another constraint. So please don't believe a test. Look if the test is made for this target group and if the test is not made for the target group then be careful with interpreting norms because I've seen a lot of children that were sent for something uh, and they were tested but the test was misinterpreted okay so that's where the um, audience actually comes in how can you take motor and the a development and motor proficiency into account when testing and training children for physical fitness. So if you do strength, the easiest thing is an isometric contraction, but it's far from functional. So from there, you can move against resistance. From there, you can start to do functional strength measures. You can do functional training uh, as strength training. It doesn't have to be in equipment. You know, if you sit down on a bench and you pick something up and you put it up there, yeah, if you have a child carry stuff on, chair, uh, on stairs, you can do aerobic training. It's just a matter of how many uh, stairs are you taking the stuff up. If they climb, there's a lot of ways where you can have children uh, be active and uh, have it in a functional way adapted to their possibilities. In the beginning, if you do a long jump, allow fallers. Give them external cues. Yeah, there's something there, there's water there, there's a crocodile there, there's something that you have to put your head through, to there's, there's balloons that you have to get out of. So get them active in a child-friendly way. Yeah, if you do aerobic fitness uh, in the beginning, use handrails, yeah? Use a stationary bike. Use protocols that are made for children with, uh, for instance, cerebral palsy. There's the Bruce protocol. There's a lot of things that were developed for different target groups and see that it, uh, that it works. The anaerobic fitness example I've shown you. Uh, turns are uh, too difficult for, young, for these young children. Use formulas that correct for BMI, because most of the children with poor motor coordination have, over, have a, a larger BMI so see that it is taken into account for their, uh, for their uh, outcomes, okay? And if you train, always be aware of the task analysis and see what the constraint for a certain uh, child may be. We have done a lot of studies where we used uh, task-oriented training for children for strength, for conditioning, uh, for coordination, and we recently finished uh, meta-analysis doing starting out with 3,000 studies ending up with 212 uh, and uh, really see that task-oriented training for children is the best solution. Uh, no impairment-based uh, interventions but try to get them in an active way. Yeah, so it is important that you find the limitations of the child within the task. So look at the sports activity, look at the skill, and see what is the limitation of the child. So if a child can do something two times, but then gives up, then it's probably fatigue. Yeah? If a child can jump, but it can't jump in a square, then it's probably the grading of the force that is important. How far can I go? Where do I go if I generate so much force? That it looks like a simple thing, but it's not. Yeah? It's the, the variability that has to go down. Yeah? If you do uh, uh, agility, I gave you an example. So there's a lot of examples how you could build gradual uh, motor control into daily activities and daily sports activities. Okay. 
So, my uh, last slide. Think what is the expected constraint of a test. The normal is, for instance, repetitions to fatigue. Could be what the developer thought was the constraint in the task. That's what I'm testing. But if you don't have a clue or you have a problem somewhere in your cerebellum to make fast reversals, then you're not testing to fatigue. Then you're testing motor coordination. Yeah? Um, so you could do motor coordination and gradually increasing cardiorespiratory uh, function. And you could also do it the other way around. You can train uh, cardiorespiratory function with low coordination and gradually build in higher levels of coordination. The important thing is that there's a challenge because then children will like it. Then children will like to do it. About 70 to 90 percent of the, what the child should do should have success. If you have 100 percent success, it's no longer fun. Yeah? You have to have new lives and new chances. Okay, make it fun. This is um, a photo of the um, children that took part in the last study and all the master students that uh, came with me and two PhD students, which I, of course, have to thank. And I also have to thank you for staying here the whole day and still listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Engelsman, for the very nice talk, very enlightening. No more and questions. the session is uh, open for questions. Um, thank you very much for the uh, talk, Rowen. I have a couple of uh, brief questions. Uh, the first one is, um, is there any, what is the correlation between the poor coordination in the upper body and the lower body in these children? Uh, it's different. Uh, the, is, the correlation between upper body and lower body is not as high as you would expect. It's not that it's a general thing. Uh, what we see in a lot of these children is that we see types. We see children that predominantly have a strength problem. We see children that predominantly have what we call the cerebellar kind. So all these reversals are a disaster. And we have children that have a huge variability. Um, so there seem to be at least three kinds because it's, it's a strange diagnosis. It's a diagnosis by exclusion. So a lot of children end up in this group and there are subgroups. And my second question was, have you done any longitudinal studies on these children? Uh, we're currently doing one in Holland. Um, we have seen a few of the children in South Africa now. I've been working there for four years now. There's some that we have followed for two years, but it's very hard to keep track of them because the houses don't have a number. Uh, the children disappear. Uh, um, there's a lot of gang activity going on, and I'm not allowed to go in there and try to f get the children back for post-measurements. Um, so we lose in our studies a lot of children, and I don't know where they are. Uh, thank you for the talk, it was, was very enlightening. My question is, is uh, when you work with this... I'm here. <laughs> when you work with, this, uh, with these kids, uh, do they learn acutely? Can I change their, 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 their path or not uh, in a very long way, but okay. uh, very acutely? We did uh, three intervention studies uh, so far with the children. Uh, the first one was task-oriented training, uh, which was an eight-week uh, eight program, and uh, they improved quite a bit on coordination. Uh, we started with a morning run, so uh, every day they, before school, they did uh, rounds around the uh, uh, playground. Uh, their uh, physical fitness improved. Um, strangely enough, the Typically, developing children took part too, because you know when we are running, and they improve more than my uh, DCD kids. But um, the other thing that we did is we ha helped the teachers 
with some uh, games that they could have the children do. So we provided them with balls, with pylons, with ropes, and uh, explained to the teachers what kind of games they could do. And that changed the behavior on the playground. And the other thing is we made the uh, hours that they go out uh, separate for the younger kids and the older kids, so they would have space. And that also changed their uh, behavior a lot, which will give um, sort of a maintenance of um, them being more active. So it's possible they, n y they don't get normal, you know? It's, it's some kind of brain dysfunction, and uh, it's not that they become normal in eight weeks, but they can learn. And the other study we did was a study on the we, because we had to do a control study. And I didn't have more therapists and no more volunteers, so the only option I had is said, well, none of these children had ever seen a we. So we had a sponsor that gave us 10 of these we's, the media marked, and then we put them there and only had to have one supervisor for all the kids doing it. And we've seen that the learning curve was the same between the uh, DCD kids and the typically developing children, because they all started at nothing. So um, they do learn. But slow. Any other question? Am I off duty? Hi. Here. Where, where, where? Ah. First of all, congratulations for your talk. It was really good. Um, actually, I have two questions. The first um, is. The, uh, is this strength deficiency that children with DCD have? Is this re uh, because they have um, like a lack, um, a lack of, how can I say, they, if they, they don't produce strength, is a lack of controlling the strength or is it both? Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. This, that's why we try to do the different studies. You know, if you have isometric quadricep strength, we would think that doing a squat is very comparable. But it's not, because the angles that you move through and the eccentric contraction sitting down and going up and sitting down and going up and controlling that, breaking here and going fast up, is very different from just measuring isometric strength. So um, it may look like it's a quad exercise that we use, that's what we use it for in strength training. Mm -hmm. But it looks like the, gen the generation of the force and the changing from one kind of contraction to the other uh, and controlling when you have to stop and when you have to switch to going down, that that may be one of the problems. But that would be an interesting thing to do with EMG because mm -hmm. you know, I, I have nothing there, plastic bags and a pylon. Okay, and thank you. And the second one is, um, based on your results, results, the strength that they produce is actually, it's not, it's not weak, it's pretty high, right? Uh -huh. Of DCD, children with DCD. Um, would, the, uh, would this be, and, and this is related to their, their body weight, you said. Yeah. Would this be different if the strength was uh, normalized by the body weight? It was. And did did yeah. you do that? We, we, in the statistical analysis, we corrected for body weight, and then we still had the difference. And, the, you know, the uh, formula for, uh, for power is corrected for weight, and for uh, VO2 max is corrected for weight. So all these were cor corrected for weight. The thing is, I never expected to find weight differences in South Africa in the townships, mm -hmm. you know? That's another thing. Um, but um, if you carry your own weight the whole day, that is the best strength training there is. And if you carry more weight, then it's normal that your quads are stronger. They're not uh, functionally stronger, because you can only carry your weight. If you would lose a lot of weight and not lose any muscle mass, then you would have a stronger muscle, but that's not how it works. Okay. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Your mm -hmm. arms were not stronger. Okay, thank you.
Posso fazer a pergunta em português? Você traduz para ela? Eu vou, posso tentar. <risos> é, gostaria de saber se você tem notado diferença na coordenação motora e aptidão física entre crianças desnutridas e crianças obesas. E quais seriam suas recomendações para trabalhar com esses dois grupos no mesmo contexto, no mesmo ambiente? Uh, she would like to know if there is uh, some difference in motor control of children with uh, obesity and uh, subnutrition. Is that? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and e, the second e part of your question. Tra... Sorry. Yes. E como trabalhar com essas crianças no mesmo ambiente ou contexto? And uh, how you uh, suggest we should work with these uh, children in the same context, in this context? Okay. Um, Children overweight, you can still do a lot. Once they're obese, it's going to be very hard to do all kinds of activities. So my major point would be, uh, like we've discussed before, try to keep them active. It doesn't matter so much what they do. Try uh, first to find something that they like. And once they are active and they like to be in the game, then the other game things come. It's always better fit yeah, fit fat, yeah, is better than uh, fat and, and not moving. Uh, fitness, uh, being active, being engaged in, in, in activities, and I would say all the televisions and all the computers have to be driven by a bicycle. It's the only way you can get the energy and they can cycle for some time and then they have put in the energy or they cycle and the television is on but get them off the screen, because there's a definite relation between screen time and obesity. Switch them off. Any final question? Yeah. Hi, thanks for your presentation. And the final question maybe how, how can you see um, these kids with DCD when they will grow up and become adults, become adults, how they will be in their lives, not on sports life or something like that, but in their jobs, family studies, uh -huh. something like that? Okay. Uh, there are not many studies about older children. Um, there are some studies that show that they, for instance, have uh, problems in traffic. Uh, that they have more injuries, more ankle sprains, more accidents. Um, so if you don't automatize a skill, you still have to pay attention to it. Because that's one of the advantages of doing something automatically. You don't have to put much, much attention in it. But if you, st you don't coordinate your movements well, you still need attention. And you can't pay attention to something else. It's what you see when you start with soccer training. You know, In the beginning, you're concentrating on the moves. Once you know the moves very well, you can concentrate on your uh, competitor. But if you are still worried about your uh, balance and where's my foot and can I put the ball over there, you can't look at the other things. And that's what happens in traffic and that's what happens with bicycling. That's what happens uh, when they walk in the woods. So they accident prone, uh, but the worst thing is they don't participate anymore. Because if you're laughed at, if you, you're, the trainer says, well, you can play with the younger team. And then you know, and when you're eight and you're still playing with the five-year-olds, then you quit. Yeah, and if you go to swimming lessons and you can't make a nice movement, um, then you won't get your, your diploma and uh, you quit swimming. So the main thing, that's why I like that there are so many physical educators here, is, is help these kids. These are the kids that you can make a difference. 
you know, everybody uh, focus on, on athletes, on the, the super ones, yeah? Well, they can do without good goods. They'll be good anyway, yeah? But these, from a health perspective, you can make a lot of changes if they stay healthy. These children get earlier, that's been looked at, uh, more heart problems, more obesity, uh, uh, more diabetes, everything that comes with it. That's the only way we can get research money, when we focus on obesity and diabetes. Uh, 